start the content. Good morning. So I always start about five minutes early just to make sure everything's working okay, people can hear me. So if you're watching this after the live event, just skip ahead to five minutes, about five minutes ahead, and that will start the content. Garden Grounds is a live, really, YouTube video series where I can answer a couple questions from people in the chat. I go over three topics. If the live videos really aren't for you, I totally understand. Uh, maybe skip Garden Grounds, but I will continue to make a lot of the short videos that I make um, probably 150 this year and you can just watch those so again the the live events really a chance for me to really talk with you all on a small scale these will go about 20 to 30 minutes the main topics today are um, last minute garden prep garden designs and trellis tre oh yeah, trellising options and ideas really january temperature outside of my house right now is 55 degrees i'm in maryland zone seven that's really warm for January. And of course, when it's warm, you want to go out, see what's going on in the garden. So these are a couple things that maybe you can do for your winter garden, get ready for the spring. And hello, everybody. So while we wait for the 11 o'clock hour, that's in about three minutes, um, throw out any questions that you have. If you like this format, where I can answer questions, I do have perk memberships, perk memberships, really is the cost of maybe a couple of um, Super Chat donations to get your question read on something like this each month. And it's really a small classroom of 25 to 50 people, maybe in the chat room at once. That'll build up a little bit over time. But it's really about teaching and mentoring. I stay on, teach a class, teach subjects, take questions, but I will really spend a good hour or so with each of you as you have questions over the year. So consider the membership perks sort of like having a mentor, you know, in your corner. All right, let me buzz through here for some questions real quick. I mean, last time it was minus two degrees here or that what that weather was coming to Maryland. Now it's been 50 and 60 degrees. I know California's being hit with that crazy rain. Um, so, I mean, weather is just fluctuating all over the states. Let me shut that off. All right, so we will get started in two minutes. Now, any questions to start? John uh, the gardener after cover crops have died by frost do you leave them in until spring um, also Maryland zone 7 I mean you can so I mean the idea is to work them into the ground and probably now would be a good time if they've died you know you do have to you can chop and drop and leave them there and just let time break them down or you can mix them into the soil now because we have a good a good eight weeks probably here before we would really plant into it and that those plants will break down a little bit more. There's a lot of different ways that you can do it. All right. All right, well, let's get, oh wait, one more thing too. So for 2023, um, I have a seed and garden shop and I wanna thank all of, the, all of you that have visited that and supported me that way. We now have an affiliate program where you will get 15% of the sale for new customers. Those new customers stay with you forever. So if you stick around for 10 years, every time that customer you found comes to the shop, you get 15% of the sale. You can go to the video descriptions, check out the pinned comments to all my videos, and it'll tell you how to kind of um, sign up for the 15% affiliate. And you just drop a link that's uniquely yours to wherever you want to send it. And if a person uses that link, come to my, comes to my shop, then you will get 15%. Sheila T, and then we'll get started with the topics. How long can soil and amendments be kept in a bag? I always end with extra bags. Um, really, forever. If your organic fertilizers in a bag and it gets wet, it's going to stink and smell terribly. So your organic fertilizers need to st stay dry. I'm going to be talking about alf alpha pellets today. That needs to stay dry. Um, but your other stuff can just sit in a bag, stay wet. Sometimes when you pull out um, maybe peat moss 
or topsoil or soils that have been wet and sitting, they're going to be covered in algae or mold or whatever. Just put them in your bed, rake it over, let it dry, let it get hit by sun, and you can use them again. They don't really go bad. All right, so let's get started with um, the last minute garden. So I've done a couple videos already to kind of prep for this chat. I did one on alfalfa filling the beds, and I just did one on trellising. We'll be talking about that. So if you missed sort of the end of the fall, middle of fall, to get your beds prepped for spring, and I'm talking about Maryland where we have freezes, December, January, February, and even in March, where you get a good 90 days of letting your soil sit, here's a couple tips. Now, if you're in a place where you don't get the freezes and you are, you know, grew for the year and now you're getting ready for spring again, your beds are probably also depleted. Depleted, So you can use these tips for that. If you were in a place where your beds are going to sit 90 days, you can use manures and compost that aren't fully broken down. You can put them into your beds. You can mix them into the top four, six inches. You can let them sit there. That 90 days will be plenty of time for that uncomposted material to continue to break down. And what I want to stress is that if you put in those materials that aren't fully broken down, composted down in spring and tried to plant within a couple of weeks, that top four inches of that new material is going to still be in the decaying process and it's going to take nitrogen from around the area so that the microbes can break down the organic matter. So while it's doing that, it's going to challenge your germinating seeds, your small transplants, and your plants may suffer. So you have to keep that in mind. So here's a whole kind of list, well, not a list, but here's an, a way to use products that don't need that 90 days to break down. Of course, if you have your own compost and all that stuff, use that. But let's just start with what you can use. So what you're trying to do is replenish beds that have sunken, you know, add in some soil. Maybe your earth beds have gotten flat, add in some soil. You want to put in organic matter, organic fertilizer, and this is really, I think, one of the cheapest ways to do it. We're not talking about adding peat moss right now. We're talking about adding materials to existing beds. So that soil quality should be a little bit better. Peat moss, cocoa core, I tend to use when I'm making um, mix to fill beds for the first time, maybe to fill containers and stuff like that. So let me just buzz real quick. Any quick questions? Um, Jody, this kind of fits into what we're saying. How do you know when leaves and garden matter that is composted is ready to use? Well, one, it'll look broken down. I have an example of it that I'm going to show you. Two, it has little odor. Or it smells sweet. It's nice and crumbly. It's fine particles. As matter is breaking down as manures or even your compost, it can still have a scent to it. If you're just doing leaves, the leaves are just going to be bigger chunks and when they're done, they're going to be small little particles. Leaves themselves, like leaf compost, leaf mold, that's a little bit more friendly to mix, well, to put on the surface of your soil um, or to mix in. It doesn't tend to take as much nitrogen as decaying matter for other things, but that's for another um, <laughs> garden grounds. So you know how really, you know that it's ready by how it smells, taking a look at it and getting a little bit of experience. All right, so let me just switch over to the demonstration camera. So this is alfalfa pellets, and this is what I recommend as a organic fertilizer. If you're worried about grazon and you're worried about sprays being in here, which people do, you can get organic alfalfa. These are feed pellets, 40 pound bags. I've talked about it, tractor supply company. When you put these in the ground, cover them up, soak them in, they crumble apart to find sawdust. And they function just like any organic granular fertilizer right here. So you can use one or the other or both. The alfalfa pellets are really less expensive. 40 pound bag nowadays costs you maybe $25. And I will um, put the videos into this video description when we're done with the live of showing you how I use the alfalfa and topsoil to fill the beds. That will give you more details. But you can really use this anyway. You could go out to your bed right now, the beds that are sunken down, sprinkle heavy handfuls across that soil, spray it or 
you know, spray it with water. Let it get, let it soak in, let it start to crumble. And then you could put materials on top of that. In about 60 days when I start planting here, this is going to be fine. It's not going to really bother your plants for nitrogen. It's not going to challenge your plants. If you don't have the alfalfa pellets, you can certainly use any organic granular fertilizer. Let me put this over here. And you would just sprinkle this down right on top of your soil. And then we would add some things on top of that. I'll show you that in a second. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to worry. Well, about getting the exact ratios of spread of the materials down. I mean, that's fine if you want to figure that out, but it's really hard to figure out. Like when it says, you know, one cup per hundred square feet sprinkled evenly, I don't even bother with that. I just sprinkle this across the top. It's a slow release organic granular fertilizer. Basically, it's the same stuff. Blood meal, bone meal, um, Alfalfa pellets may be in here. Alfalfa meal might be in here. Cottonseed meal, chicken manure, all kinds of stuff. Sprinkle it down, wet it down. It functions just like the alfalfa. What I like about this is that it has a natural growth hormone that really does help plants grow. So this is just a way to save money. Use either, use both. So if you're looking at these pictures, when they're wet, we have this one. A, we'll call, and we have this one, B. Which one is the cheap topsoil? Which one is my leaf compost? And it's hard to tell when they're wet because when they're wet, they've got this beautiful color. This is my compost and leaf compost. And let's see if I can do this. Just look how beautiful that stuff is. Little bits of wood and air from branches and stuff like that. But it's well broken down, well decomposed. And from Jody's question, this is what you're looking for. So if you have plenty of this, you can go ahead and put that in your garden. This is the cheap topsoil. And when we get closer, it is really just shredded wood. There's a lot of wood in there. And that shredded wood has to still decay and break down. So if you use this, the decaying process for the wood could challenge your plants for nitrogen. That's why you want to give it, I think, at least 30 days, 60 days to break down a little more. And the trick to use is if you're using, you know, a cheaper topsoil that looks like this, after you put it down, soak it in with uh, fish emulsion or other organic water-soluble fertilizers. That will put a lot of nitrogen on here. And over the next 30 to 60 days, that will help this decay and break down and you won't really have a whole problem. This is the quick setup. You know, if you get the last minute, you know, needs to fill your beds, I put down the alfalfa right on the bed. Then I put down about two inches or so of the cheaper topsoil. I do add more alfalfa right onto that. And then I come in with my compost to top off the last inch or two. And I just spread that across the top. And that sets my beds up really quickly for spring use here in Maryland where you have the winters. And it can be done where you don't have winters and you're just kind of refreshing your beds. It's a cheaper way to do things. You could spend money and get, you know, tons of compost if you don't have it. Um, but building soil is kind of a slow and steady kind of race. You just want to be adding stuff year after year. And a trick to deal with materials that may not be fully broken down is to give them a good soaking of fish emulsion, which is high in nitrogen, or some other water-soluble organic fertilizer that the nitrogen will be present. It will get used up in the decomposition process. That process is a little bit slower, or a lot slower actually, when it's freezing and cold out. But you're going to make it a nice happy medium to get your beds ready come spring. Now, that being said, if you're putting transplants into your beds where, like, let's say you're in California and you set this all up, you can pretty much after a week or two go ahead and do this. Just clear out a hole, put in maybe better material, put in your transplants. And as the roots spread out and grow, they're going to find a good place to collect the nutrients they need. And all the stuff that you're putting in now will break down and feed the plants over the season. If you were going to put seeds down right away, you don't want to put seeds down into something like this. It's just too woody and you know it's going to need more time to break down. 
you would want to be putting it, you know, into your compost and things will grow really well that way from seed. And here's the, the tip, really. Uh, let me get back to the main camera. If you're just doing this for the first time, give it a try, take some notes. And if you put in transplants and you find they don't grow, they start to yellow a little bit, that's because the decaying process is still happening. So you just kind of want to fix up a little bit of what you're putting in there and, you know, take notes, change it up a little bit. If you notice that the transplants are yellowing, hit them with that organic water soluble. That will give them nitrogen. They will get on their way. Soon the roots will go deep past that four to six inch mark, get to, you know, soil that's not competing for nitrogen through decomposing or through yeah, through the decomposition process, and everything will turn out right. You can't really fix seedlings that are struggling if you put them into materials that aren't fully broken down. Um, it's it's just tougher. So you might have to kind of reseed and do that. All right, let me grab some quick questions, and then we'll move over to garden designs here. All right. And again, when you're putting a question in, please just write question. It's a little bit easier for me to find that way. Or you could do a super chat. Just reading these real quick. Yeah, so if you're topping your bed with straw or hay, Depending on which one it is, some of them have more seeds. So you want to just be careful. And they are going to pop up. Good news is if you do a quick rake, you'll kill them off. Um, but it can be a problem. Urban Chicken Mama. How often should we be adding alfalfa pellets? So it varies, but I like to add some at the end of my season. Again, I'm in Maryland. So sometime in the middle of the fall, I do them again in the spring. And that's all you really need. I may add some mid-season just to um, add some more of the organic matter that you know has the N, P, and K in it. So how I do it in the middle of the, the summer is I put it down just before maybe I put in you know two inches of grass on there, or I or before I put on it, it, yeah, <laughs> or before I put on additional mulch to maintain moisture. I like the alfalfa to be covered by something in the summer. So it stays moist, soil biology can get to it, worms can get to it, and it begins to break down quicker. That's a good question because there are like, I used to say a thousand ways to garden. There's probably like 10,000 ways. So you don't have to over worry that you do it exactly as Gary at the Rustic Garden says or somebody else says. You can kind of pick what you like, figure out what works for you, and just kind of build on that year after year. Worms do like the pellets. The other thing with the pellets too um, is I have not had mice, voles, or moles go after them. The rabbits tend to leave them alone too when I put them outside the fence. But if you're worried about animals, soak it right away. Soak it again the next day. It's going to crumble into fine particles. You can, If you're putting it right on the soil of your uh, surface of your soil, soak it a couple of days, let it break down, and then just gently rake it into the top. Animals will leave it alone. All right. Uh, one more question. Do you add mulch before or after the seeds germinate in a bed? So seedlings, I do not mulch. Um, or I wait several weeks to many weeks until the plants are bigger. It depends on what you're growing. Um, I don't really mulch around like lettuces and spinach and stuff like that because I don't like the mulch getting into the leaves when I go to eat it and because they grow pretty quickly. If I'm planting plants that get a foot tall and grow all season like the warm crops, when they get... I don't know, eight or 12 inches tall, I will add mulch in there. Um, seedlings really want to germinate, not be smothered by mulch, and you may have to water a little bit more for the first two weeks to get them established because you're not using mulch. All right, so garden designs. So January is a great time to go out into your garden. And in my garden, you'll notice I have root pouches, which I sell at my shop perfect for growing just about any vegetable that you want. And maybe you have a small space, you want to add to that, you want to do a container garden. 
I have lots of raised beds, I have framed beds, I have earth beds, I have no dig beds. So I have a mix of everything. But every year I like to go in, kind of look around and figure out how can I adjust my space or my bed to get more growing room. And they may, that may be adding in additional um, root pouches, that may be shrinking the space of the walking paths, that may be changing over how, like for instance, two years ago, I probably had a patch of asparagus that was, I don't know, let's just say 40 feet long. Well, I found I only need it to be 20 feet. So I removed 20 feet worth of asparagus and I dropped in raised beds into there and really added to the space of my garden so that I can grow a whole lot in there and I grow root, root crops in there. So if you haven't done it, you know, now's a great time to walk your garden and think about how and where you want to make changes. And when the weather is cooler, you get these unseasonably warm days, which is still cool, 55, 60 degrees. It's a, just really a great time to start doing those redesigns. Anybody working on um, a cool redesign or anything they want to share with the group, I find that the people in the chat help each other out um, quite a bit. So put your ideas out there. And again, if you like this format, these um, garden grounds are public lives for everybody. It can be a little bit difficult answering questions because so many people sign into the chat, which is wonderful. They go about 20 or 30 minutes. If you want to join my perk memberships, I do this format in different levels and different ways, but the groups are small and I really stay on um, with the goal to answer 100% of your questions. And maybe this would be something um, you want for a season. Just if you're getting started and you know you have a lot of questions, I do mentoring Q&As three times a month and you can bring whatever question you have there. That was a good question, Jay-Z, on the seeds. So you don't want to grow seeds in mulch that you just put down. You want them to be more in your soil, um, your fully composted leaf compost and stuff like that. You want them to have soil contact and not an inch of some sort of mulch to grow into. All right, so let's go to the next thing, which I really enjoy, um, and that's trellising. So I just did a full video on that yesterday. But trellising is doesn't have to be expensive. My first tip for trellising is if you go to buy your trellising materials at a garden store or shop, you very often pay twice as much than going to Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, big box stores, hardware stores, any place that isn't a garden shop, you can find all these materials really cheaply. And you can repurpose so many things that you may find at these stores um, for your garden. The other tip I recommend is go to uh, yard sales, flea markets, etc. And just walk around with the idea of what can I grow my plants up. So with trellising, I've talked about this a lot. I'm not going to really focus on it very long. But trellising is really about growing vertically. So a tomato plant is meant to grow all over the place. It can sprawl 8 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, cover a space, roots out in different parts where the vine contacts the ground. But it can be unsightly and unmanageable. If you grow it straight up a post, 8 feet, you can put four plants in a four foot by eight foot space you can put other crops down so you can contain the plant you can grow more vegetables in the space and you can get more harvest more quickly i think people pretty much understand that the biggest question i get with trellising is what direction do i put them do i put them so that if it's a rainbow or if it's a wall is the south where my face is or do you put it where it's on the east or west side of the bed so that if my head is the sun, the full sun is hitting the bed. And that's really up to you. It depends on what you're growing. So when we're talking about garden designs, you want to kind of think over last year, did your trellises provide too much shade? Did they shade off certain plants? Did you plant in a way that really wasn't um, productive because the trellising shade got in the way? Or do you want your trellis to create more shade and in that shady spot, you may grow cool weather crops that like cooler soil temperatures, cooler day temperatures, and it's a way to extend the season. So it's really up to you as if you put the um, 
you know, the trellis on the south, east, west, I think I have that right. And then the back of it would be the north. When you put a trellis on the north side of your bed, the west and southern sun will always push the shadow outside of the bed into the walking path, or if you have another bed on that side, into that bed. So that's sort of the strategy with trellising is to know how your sun tracks through your yard and then set them up in a way that this shade falls exactly where you want it. Um, there's lots of ideas. I mean, you can use regular posts. I use the closet racks, old ladders. People use, um, they strip down damaged beds. They use the springs from the damaged beds. That looks really cool if you set it up the right way. Um, all kinds of different things can be used for trellising. Some plants may only need to be trellised up four feet. Some tr plants may need to trellis not necessarily 12 feet tall, but you know, you can go eight feet up. This is a tip with a plant that may be, uh, that may grow to 12 feet as it gets to the eight foot mark and eight foot for me, I'm six feet tall. So my hands, I can reach up to eight feet. When the vine starts getting beyond eight feet, pull it out and let it kind of drop and then curl that vine downward and grow back down the trellis. So you may need a trellis for going up and then you may need a trellis for a vine coming down. So that is also part of the design is thinking about what you want to grow there. Butternut squash, for instance, take up a lot of space. Acorn squash, um, all your winter squash can really vine out and grow. Of course, you can buy dwarf varieties if you want to do that too. Uh, runner beans, lima beans, pole beans can take up a lot of space. There's a lot of beans that get about three, four feet tall, a little more so than a bush bean, and they could just use kind of a small trellising area. It's a good way to grow. Um, what else are people using for, you know, your trellises if you want to throw them out there? So we have that question. Any other questions? Two gals is talking about sunflower. So I do, I actually have sunflower seeds that will grow on their own because I grow them every year, seeds fall, and they start growing actually in April. And believe it or not, they can take a little bit of a frost. Anyway, they get pretty large come the end of June and I will grow um, pole beans up that. You know, pole beans are nice and light. They grow up anything. So you can grow sunflowers up that. A lot of your early crops in the cool weather are really it's peas peas need that kind of trellising they have hollow stems and then as you get into the warmer crops that's when the vine vining plants are really ready to go in the ground that's when you want to have your trellis systems you know set up just checking the questions oh old wood umbrellas that's kind of cool that the umbrella would be kind of cool because you could actually put a T post or U post in the ground. They're metal, they're solid. You could then tie the handle and the base of the umbrella right to that. And then if it's you open it up, if you cut off all the nylon, you should have metal or something along there where stuff could grow on that. That would kind of look cool. Old pool poles are a good idea. They're um usually aluminum so they can get really tall and let me make sure i got who said it and patty was saying she uses chicken wire so if you put a pole in the ground you know maybe it's this wide you know a nice solid post pole and then you get chicken wire and you cut it into let's say one foot or two foot strips you can kind of just roll it down that um pool pole or your stake and that's perfect for a set of green beans to grow up there you can put three green bean seeds in the bottom of that and that will grow up in the space so it's a nice compact one foot space maybe two foot space growing vertically held in place by a single pole and then your pole beans can grow it's six eight ten feet right up of that well jolene ladder mesh so let me where are we at with time all right so we're going to finish up in, a, in about six minutes so this will be the last thought i'll stay on till um 11 30 and then uh, the Garden Grounds will be live the last Thursday of January. I'm going to be away for a couple of Thursdays. So 11 o'clock Garden Grounds, I think maybe the 25th of January, whatever Thursday is close to that. So, oh no, I lost the question. Um, Jolene, I need to get ladder mesh. I want to plant watermelon in some 20. So ladder mesh is this thin 
aluminum, I guess, material. It's kind of what you see at the bottom of like political signs and for sale signs where they're stuck all over, you know, the roads and stuff like that. I get mine at Home Depot, Snowden, River Parkway. They're always there. I don't have a link for them. Many places don't carry them. A lot of people, when you ask for the ladder mesh at Home Depot, look at you like you're crazy. But if you go to the section where they have the wrought iron, um, fencing, posts, concrete, cement, that's usually where they are if they have them. And they come in 10 foot pieces and they very easily slide down the stake like the chicken wire. And they also rainbow nicely that you can tuck them in different parts of your garden, different beds, make all kinds of shapes and you can grow up them. But ladder mesh can be hard to find. All right, so that kind of wraps up the main three questions. If you have any other questions on kind of last minute soil prep, your garden designs, trellising options, etc., please toss them out there. I'm going to stay on for about four more minutes and stick true to keeping these garden grounds about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, Meemaws, I saw your strawberries in the green stock tower. Um, so I have vertical towers. I'm affiliated with Greenstock. If you check out my video descriptions, you can find a way to purchase those, get a little bit of a discount. You're in five central. So I don't, I don't know. Like a lot of people ask me, so I get freezing temperatures. My Greenstock soil freezes through solid. My strawberries come back year after year. Strawberries are pretty hardy. You could do that, I suppose. I'm just not sure how cold your temperatures get for extended periods like weeks. If it is a problem, you could grow in there and they unstack and maybe put them in a garage or a place that's warmer or move them closer to the south side of your house. That's then, that tends to stay warmer. But any of you in the chat that grow strawberries in zone five, maybe you can help Meemaws out with how hardy strawberries are. I mean, pretty much, Meemaw, if you've planted strawberries in the ground and you leave them out there all winter and they come back in the spring and they do that regularly, then you can put them in a green stock tower. I guess that's a better way to say it. If you know your strawberry plants survive your winters in the ground, they come back with, you know, full force, then you can put them into the towers. All right. Uh, we're going to end on this question. Jillian says, how can I deal with quack grass that grew rampant this year? Um, so there's a lot of different names for quack grass, like um, wire grass and all that kind of stuff. It's really hard. Like if it, you, you pretty much have to pull it out by hand, you have to remove it. If you till it or chop it, wire grass, quack grass, similar group, they just re-sprout and you're just kind of spreading the problem. Um, you can cover them and smother them and keep the light out and eventually they die off. You know, chemicals work. However, then you probably don't want to plant in there for 60 or 90 days. You know, it's a tough problem that's really solved organically by digging and removing. And, you know, it's hard to do. Um... And then urban, okay, we'll leave on this one because it's a good, what night temperature is it warm enough to start uncovering things? I use five mil, uh, five mil plastic. So I don't know. It depends on the crop um, and your temperatures. I know you're in a place that stays a little bit warmer. But if you feel like, I, I don't know, actually, is the answer. It depends on the crop. Cool crops, you can certainly probably remove them now if the night temperatures are staying in the 40s. Your warm crops... You know, when the night temperatures are in the upper 50s, that's a good time to remove it. It's just that potential frost it won't, won't really damage your cool crops, but it could damage the warm crops that are growing. Okay, I keep saying I'm going to leave, but here's a good question. And again, if you want to do the membership perks, I hang out for a long time and answer questions. Um, Chef Chris... Triple digit heat, summer 22, that's really hot. 
40% shade cloth would help, I would definitely go to 50, 60, maybe even 70% shade cloth with temperatures like that. The whole goal, and I'll be talking about this in future um, garden grounds and in future videos. Um, if you check out my trellising video, I talk about how to use the trellises for shade cloth. You want those plants to stay cooler, but more importantly, you want enough shade on the ground for that ground to cool around the root system. So I would go with the higher shade cloth. All right, so I will see you guys for garden grounds uh, towards the end of January. Hope you guys had a great new year. Time to get out into your garden. Think, think about 2023, think about garden designs and start making some changes. All right, everybody, take care.